Amen. Uh, again, it's been an honor to be here, and uh, I cannot express enough uh, our uh, love and affection for the Versailles. I love, uh, amen. Love you, brother. Um, we we'll have a lesson right now, amen? amen. Open to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Now, what's my logic with this text? Well, it's the Festival of the Americas. And um, I figured, let me look up a passage where there's a lot of festivity happening. So that's why we're there. <laughs> that's, why, that's why we're there. Uh, but last night was pretty awesome. And, you know, you can't, you can't turn down food. So everywhere you went, it was like, you have to eat this. You have to eat this. You have to eat this. And it was all awesome. Amen. So it was great. And the dancing was great. I love dancing all types of music. But I love merengue, salsa, bachata. And that's just awesome. So it was a great, great time uh, together last night. So, and... Um, Amen. If there could be a title, I guess uh, it would be, The King is Here. The King is Here. And John chapter 12, we're going to pick up a moment that, which is pretty awesome, when Jesus enters Jerusalem finally as a proper king of Israel. And, and right before this, it's amazing because uh, uh, in John 12, right before this, Mary actually poured perfume on Jesus' feet. And she broke an alabaster jar and poured perfume on his feet, and the text says that it, it filled the, the, whole, the whole house with an aroma. Little did she know that perhaps she was anointing the future king. And that so you, when, you, when you think of Jesus entering Jerusalem, he's been anointed in a sense, but he has this aroma on him. It's filling up Jerusalem, which is pretty, pretty awesome if you think about it. But also perhaps he's being, she's being anointing him without realizing for his, prop, for his burial. But in uh, John 12, we'll pick up in verse 12. The next day, the great crowd had come for the festival heard, that heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See your king. Is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they re realize that these things had been written about him, that these things had to be done to him. And now the crowd that was with him, when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to spread word, to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed that sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look, the whole world is going after him. And that is our uh, text this afternoon. It's a joyful moment, you know. P pilgrims are making their way all the way to Jerusalem from all different directions. They're celebrating, coming to celebrate the Passover. And what is the Passover? It's a moment in the Old Testament where God would use Moses to rescue his people from slavery. So here, God would command them to come every year to remember that moment, to remember what God did. So it's not just even what God did in the past, but what God will do in the future. It gave you great confidence. And as they would approach Jerusalem, there's actually, they would sing these songs. Your, 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 your book of Psalms actually has a song book in it. How do you know that? But it, the song, songs of ascent, and they would sing these songs and come together. You can imagine Jerusalem as they're coming together and sing these songs, remembering this great moment. And it would get louder and louder and louder. The population of Jerusalem would, would swell. And it's at this moment that we see our Jesus approaching Jerusalem. So this Passover will be very different. Very, very different. Why? Because finally, the king is here. The king is here. And there's all this commotion. Everyone's reacting, trying to figure out what's going on. The crowds are responding. The disciples, the Pharisees. If you were there, what would be going through your mind? What would be going through your mind? I have about three points this afternoon. Point number one. Point one. Put your hope in Jesus. Put your hope in Jesus. It says the crowd heard that Jesus was coming that direction. And they have, you can, you can visualize this, they have these palm branches. We'll talk about that in a little bit. They're waving these palm branches. They're shouting. And they're, everything at that moment is pointing to one person, which is? Jesus. You can't even miss it if you're there. You're like, what's going on? Oh, it's Jesus. And they're shouting, Hosanna, which save us. Like, wow. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Blessed is the king of Israel. It's, it's amazing because at one point uh, in Luke's account, and all four Gospels have this in, uh, in the Gospels, and, and Luke's account, it says that the Pharisees are saying, basically, Jesus, tell your disciples to be quiet. And his response is, you can't stop this. Even the stones will cry out. They heard Jesus is coming, and perhaps they've heard at this point, it's at the end of Jesus' ministry. So word has been traveling. Word has been traveling everywhere. So finally, everything points to Jesus, and they're saying in Aramaic, Hosanna, please save us now. They're looking for a king to save him, and finally a king is there. Who's their great hope? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. All the miracles they heard about, even Lazarus is there like, yeah, it's pretty awesome. This is pretty awesome. I mean, put, come on, come on, guys. It's, like, it's pretty awesome. He's like a traveling, walking billboard. Just everywhere he goes, it's like... <sighs> but it's amazing because everything points to Jesus. Everything is about Jesus. They had great confidence because Jesus is fulfilling Old Testament prophecies. And there are Jews coming in and they would recall passages. And you think about, there's so many passages, prophecies about Jesus being born, even from the very beginning. Even these interesting magi come from the east. They're traveling to figure out who is this king. So something is happening. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. They're actually quoting Psalms 118. They're figuring out something is happening. Finally, our hope is here and our hope is only in Jesus. You know, why should we have this great hope in Jesus? Because they're aware of all the other kings in the Old Testament. And how do they fare? It started off with King Saul, and now we're with King Jesus. And they realize he's a different kind of king, isn't he? He's a different king. You know, he's, this is our king coming in, and how do, he comes in humbly. Riding a donkey. I mean, come on, guys. That's not going to be my choice of travel. But he comes in, and it's pretty cool because uh, the great prophet Zechariah is, things are happening, everything's coming at the right time. And he's a different kind of king from all types of king. He's a humble king. He's a very, very humble king. And Jesus doesn't say, at least in our text here, he doesn't say anything because everyone else says it for him. Everything points to him. Interesting, in the ancient times, when, uh, when, they, had, when they would come in, after these great conquests, conquest, they would have these triumphal entries. They'll come in as heroes with bringing their spoils from their battles and I mean, these massive horses. And Jesus comes in different. How great confidence can we have in our king? Lots of great confidence, right? All of our hope is in Jesus. It's amazing. This great king of ours, the next chapter is washing feet. He's washing feet. And if washed Judas' feet, who would wash our feet? So everything points to Jesus. So it's for us to remember that we put all of our hope in what? Jesus. But putting your hope in something is a choice. So brothers and sisters, for those who are visiting, where is your hope at today? Ask yourself that tough question. Where is your hope at today? Where has your hope been? The scriptures tell us to put our hope in the right thing. I don't got time to go over, but Psalms 42, verse 5, Psalms 42, verse 11, and Psalm 43, verse 5 say the same thing. It's as if the psalmist is talking to himself by saying, why are you so downcast? Why are you so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. It is a choice. Where is your hope at today? Is it in your success? It is in your job. It is in the economy. Is it in gas prices? You think, I got a raise. I just went back to normal. Amen. That's whatever. Or for sure, we know. I don't know how it is over here. I'm from Virginia. Let's put our hope in politicians. I went to school for a... Uh, Economics and the school I went to was all about public choice economics, all about politics and everything. You go, the only solution is Jesus. 
That's the only solution. He's the only one that's that humble to wash your feet. So put your hope in Jesus. Second point. Just keep following. Just keep following. There's a lot of confusion. You know, yeah, just keep swimming. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Maybe I plagiarized without realizing. I don't know. Just keep following. Just keep swimming. Amen. You know, the, there's a lot of confusion of people having these palm branches, you know, and what does that mean? Well, it's interesting because two centuries prior to this moment, the Syrians had, had uh, private, prior to that, attacked Jerusalem, and you had a Jew by the name of Simon the Maccabee who actually drove out the Syrians. In response to this, they started waving these palm trees that are very accessible there, not realizing that that palm tree would become later on a sign of nationalism. Music will be played, though, though these palm branches will be there. And so even at times when Rome, they, they didn't like Rome, they found coins that were like rebellious coins with palm trees on them. And so it's like, I don't know, if there's, there's things you can see now, it becomes, you know, but, but for them it was like, finally, revolution! Revolution! Uh, overthrow Rome! Yeah, he's an overthrown Rome, all right? Not exactly what you think, though. Even the disciples are a bit confused, you know, even, what's the text say? It says, at first his disciples did not understand all this. And I love that part, only after. So we think they, they grasp everything. And in our ignorance, we go, if I was there, it would all make sense. No, they're bright, you know, they're like, uh, what's happening? There's palm trees, there's a donkey, uh, what's happening? What's happening here? They're confused. Now, by the way, I love this because... Um, you know, the disciples, we have to step back and think how different they were. One of, the, one of the disciples is Simon the Zealot. Zealots were really intense. They, all they want to do is overthrow Rome. So in his mind, he's one of the apostles. By the way, him as a contrast, can you imagine Simon the Zealot with Matthew the tax collector? Forget Republican Democrat. That is extreme. Because if you're Simon the Zealot and you want to overthrow even to murder, and then you have your brother who's like collecting taxes for Rome, you're like, really? That was, you know, it's like, could I find another job or something? But what's amazing is, I'm sure Simon the Zealot was like, yes, finally, this is going to happen. The Sons of Thunder are like, yes, come on. Peter was like strapped, you know he has a sword already. He's like, let's do this. Let's do this. Finally, finally, overthrow Rome. Things don't make sense. You kind of go on in their minds. If, if you were there, you would go, finally. I know, um, I don't know if you guys like superhero movies. If you do, great for you. Um, but there's Avengers and all these. Can, can you imagine coming in? There's no Avenger like Jesus. I mean, what Avenger? Hey, look, he walks on water. You're walking in, we're going to overthrow Rome. He turns water to wine. Can I get an amen? Amen. Maybe that's just me. Sorry. Evil spirits are terrified of Jesus. He can heal across time and even distance at a word. There is right there a visual of a man he raised from the dead. So we're going to Jerusalem. They're like, we have a secret weapon. So they're a bit confused. You think, wow. But you know what's encouraging about all this is that even from the very beginning, Jesus calls him, and one of the things that happened quite a bit, it's good to study it out. From the very beginning of Mark chapter 1, he just says two words over and over again. Follow me. Jesus never tells them where they're going. Ever. Ever. In Luke 9, he goes, follow me. Just follow me. At the end of John 20, right? At the end of John, when Peter has to be, in a sense, restored back. And he's like, what about him? Don't worry about him. You need to. Follow me. And here we have a moment. It doesn't make sense. Believe it or not, if you're going to make a decision to follow God, there'll be plenty of times that things don't make sense. You know, you don't have a choice. It's just part of discipleship. It's part of following God. 
And the older you get as a disciple, I've turned 27 years this past June, I realize how much I don't know. And I don't like that sometimes. You think, wow. But all they knew and the confidence they had is just, just keep following Jesus. And even whatever happens in the country, whatever happens even within the fellowship, whatever happens anywhere, what should we do? Just keep following. Just keep following. By the way, I don't know where you're at spiritually. You don't know where I'm at spiritually. <laughs> it's true. But the good thing is, you know what? Because it's confusing sometimes. I'm going to keep following Jesus. They start off with follow me, and right now still follow me. Just keep following Jesus. If things are not clear, just get up, get up in the morning, read God's word, let, it, let his thoughts dominate your thoughts. Talk to your creator. You say, one step at a time, just keep following. It says later on, it says after, they understood later on. You only, it only makes sense afterwards. Just keep following. As a family, just keep following. As a married couple, just keep following Jesus. Your confidence is not in yourself, but it's confidence in Jesus. Third and last point. He has come to rescue us. You know, the crowd, I mean, they're singing Hosanna. And it's amazing because, again, it's recalling this great moment when God rescued them. But it's not just, as I remember this, God wants us to remember, but it's also uh, God wanted them to celebrate the Passover because it, it helped them remember, but it also gave them great confidence that God will rescue them in the present. And it's, it's good to remember that, that God is here to rescue us. I mean, how often does God, the scripture says God delivered. God delivered. Even after sin, they cried out and God delivered. Over and over and over again. And I love the book of Judges. It's pretty dark. But you see, every time they cried out, God delivered. So we have great confidence that God will deliver us even today. That God has delivered us in the past. Praise God when we, our sins were washed away. But also God will save us now. All we got to do is just keep following and having great confidence in him. But you know, it's amazing. I think we, 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 for them, they're like, please, save us from Rome. And Jesus is going to save them from something worse than Rome. And Jesus saves us from something worse than Rome. He saves us from our greatest enemy, yourself. Your greatest enemy is yourself. My track record before I became a disciple and I trust myself doesn't really work out. And every time I trust myself, I just make a mess of things. So here they're saying, please save us from these enemies. I'm here to save you from you. I'm here to save you from you. It helps us to have a perspective and a humble perspective with Jesus and, and to realize I got to keep on following Jesus, staying close to his word, hearing his voice, because he wants to rescue us continually, but rescue us from our own mess. To not follow Jesus is to you know, lose out on that great blessing, isn't it? Jesus, please rescue us. You know, Jesus would say, uh, Peter, when he's preaching to a crowd in Acts chapter 3, he tells him this. When God, raised up, when God raised him up, he sent him first to you to bless you from turning each of you from your own wicked ways. He rescued you from sin, but he rescued you from the path you're going to go. What a blessing it is, isn't it? He comes to rescue us from ourselves. You know, I think for us, you know, I, the blessing for us to stay close to God in our marriages is that he rescues us from having hard marriages, isn't it? But we have to make that choice. For our kids, do we trust the world or we keep on trusting Jesus? He'll rescue us. For us to reflect on all this, where is your great confidence in God this afternoon? Where has it been? And if it hasn't been the right place, well, praise God for grace. 
and have great confidence in him. A great assurance that he always comes through. You know, it's a silly example that I use, but, you know, when we came back in the States, uh, we had to land, and then um, I love it when they pull your um, <clears throat> credit score. What's your FICO score? Oh, please don't look it up. But you know one of the beautiful things about spending time in God's Word is in the chance, in the way I get to pull God's credit. And how faithful has God been from the very beginning? How faithful has he been? This is good for us. Sometimes we wonder, can God be faithful with me? Why don't you spend time in God's Word and realize how faithful he's been in the past? And it gives great confidence today. God always comes through. What a blessing it is. I've got to put my hope in Jesus. I've got to keep moving forward and knowing that he will rescue us. Amen? Now, lastly, I'll finish up with a quick thought, you know, Lazarus. You know, Lazarus is just marching around, having a good time. And it says that the crowd is just there because of Lazarus. I think it's powerful to remember and don't underestimate how God can use your story. And as you walk around Phoenix, or wherever you're at this week, you get a chance to be a walking billboard. And especially, again, I don't know how it is here, but sometimes I'll come across people who are like, even disciples, oh, look, everything's falling apart. Oh, man. And I'm like, uh, oh, I, it seems like it. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> but if it's that dark, what an opportunity for light. What a blessing. And so when neighbors or coworkers like, things are falling apart, you have an option to go, but we have God. Yeah. Or we can go, yes, it's falling apart. Don't do that. Hold the nation. Let's pray together for the nation. Let's do something but put our hope in God. So we have Lazarus who's just happy, having a good time, and everything points back to Jesus. He's a walking billboard for Jesus, and you get to be a walking billboard for Jesus yourself. Interesting what Mary would do to fill the aroma, and now Jesus would, that aroma would fill all Jerusalem. And we get a chance to be like that, to fill the aroma wherever we go. So three thoughts this afternoon, brothers and sisters. The king is here to put your hope in Jesus. Reflect where your hope has been. And it's good, by the way, on the way home, or perhaps later on, to talk in your family. Where has my hope been at? And if you're married, uh, buckle up first. Because they will tell you, but be gracious, by the way. Honey, whatever, whatever you call each other, where's my hope been? And if you don't want to ask that question, that says something about you. You get upset, whatever, I don't even okay. Keep moving forward. Our, our confidence is in who we follow. And lastly, just know that, you know, it's God who rescues us. Our great confidence is in our king. It's been an honor to be with you. Thank you for your time.